Do you believe that diversity, equity, inclusion are an important part, are an essential part of organizations operating in the theater? You can put up all the statements you want, but if you're not practicing it, it sort of dis defeats the purpose. <laughs> we will no longer be overlooked. We will no longer accept the status quo. We will no longer be silent. It is time to be heard. Theater Company's Be Heard series, where we talk with several Black, Indigenous, People of Color, or BIPOC artists and educators about systemic racism in the arts community and society as a whole, and ultimately what we can do about it. My name is JP Pollinger, I use they, them pronouns, and I'll be conducting today's interview. In this episode, we have the honor and privilege of having a conversation with Jennifer Chang, a director and actor who has shared her talents all around the Southern California area. Chang believes storytelling remains necessary in the face of challenges to soothe spirits, teach lessons, and carry us forward in our humanity. She is a founding member of Chalk Repertory Theater in Los Angeles, where she has served as artistic producing director and continues to produce, direct, and act in numerous projects and serve on the artistic circle. Chang is also a member of the inaugural Directors Council for the Drama League, is currently faculty at UCSD's Department of Theater and Dance and serves as head of the undergraduate acting program, where she teaches acting and directing as well as professional and business development. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. How Hi. are you today? Thank you for joining Very us. Good. Thanks for inviting me. Um, let's, yeah, um, uh, let's dive right in. Um, in 2008, you started Chalk Repertory Theater with the mission to work with diverse groups of artists to create works that are intimate, accessible, and events to attend with four people that graduated with you from the MFA Theater program at UC San Diego. Mm -hmm. When in your journey as an artist did you decide that expansive, inclusive, non-traditional, and rule-breaking work was what you wanted to focus on? Um, wow, thank you for that question. Um, you know, it, um, you know, training, I think there's, there's this moment that's happening right now that's been a long time coming in terms of training that as the population of students at training programs want to train, become increasingly diverse and reflect the diversity of our nation, you know, that we, and um, by we, I mean institutions, um, have fallen behind in terms of um, how do you actually um, acknowledge someone's lived experience and integrate that into the training program and not just tokenize a student and say, oh, we want diversity, right? And then you have a diverse group of people and you don't actually know how to care for them. Um, so that's been a long time coming that I felt very keenly as a student, both as an undergrad and as a grad student, where I felt like my school didn't know what to do with me, you know, and, you know, they... They recruited me, I got in, I, you know, did the program, but I felt something was amiss. And I'm so, you know, just in awe of your generation of folks coming up who have this vocabulary, you know, words are things, words are really powerful, who have this vocabulary to speak to, um, you know, like implicit bias, we didn't have that word. Um, you know, triggers, we didn't have that word really, you know, as part of the lexicon of, of how we were just learning. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, the tokenism, I don't think that that was something that was in the broader lexicon as well. And um, I, would, I would bring up things that I would feel while I was in the program, but I didn't, again, didn't have the vocabulary to really talk about it. And so I'd feel very limited. 
And I think would seem to my predominantly white institution that I'm trying to bring my concerns to um, would seem like just complaints by a grad student who is unhappy with their casting or something so overly simplified by that. But, you know, but um, in grad school, I got cast as a lot of old people because they didn't know what to do with me. And then when it came time to do showcase, suddenly there was this desire to put me out there as, you know, a sexy Asian girl, which, you know, we're seeing the ramifications of that, of objectifying Asian women um, that still exists today. So, you know, so that limitation was something I keenly felt. And in grad school also started um, a theater festival that was focused on the AAPI communities. We did the first Asian American theater festival that actually had a life of its own after I left. And, um, you know, I was the only Asian student for the time that I was there uh, in the acting program. So I had built community with my fellow um, API students were in the undergrad program. And when I graduated, I, I was lucky enough to work with the National Asian American Theater Company in New York and East Coast Players in LA. So very plugged in, very inspired, you know, felt really supported by the Asian American community. But I also noticed that um, separate was not equal. And I think it still exists today where you know, there might be theater companies of color that are amazing and, you know, um, really help support the community, make work for the community, um, shepherd artists through their careers, you know, um, helping them grow as artists. But the general population um, doesn't see that work as equal, right? Or says it's not for me. And so a broader theater audience isn't coming to that, you know, theater company or, you know, the funding goes to a predominantly white institution to service their needs to want to diversify their, you know, season or whatever, instead of giving the same grants to, you know, the theater company of color that's actually very directly servicing the community. So I was seeing that, you know, systemic inequity and um, at the same time, you know, I was trying to start a career in LA out of grad school and noticing that there are a lot of folks like me who had had a lot of training and were kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting for the next job, um, which I, I think is not a unique story. I'm sure that there's some of that here too in the founding of your theater company, you know, and have a group of friends that you just want to do plays with and you don't want to wait to be given permission. Um, and I would get questions like, oh, are you founding an, a the an Asian theater company? I said, no, you know, I think that the most radical thing I can do right now to demonstrate that people of color are just as talented, right? Because there's, I think even today, this idea that, oh, that talent doesn't exist. Where can we find them? You know, are they ready for this? Um, is to really demonstrate that different people can exist side by side and still serve as story and still, you know, you can still cast to the, you know, with some consciousness of their appearance, how they present, as well as their lived experience, um, and still honor the playwright's intention for the play, right? What is the storytelling intention? Um, and, and so we did that without even knowing these words, right? Color conscious, identity conscious. Uh, we didn't know those words. It was just a, you know, we were moving forward with a feeling of why can't, you know, and partly, you know, hubris that I wanted to do Three Sisters. And I would, somebody would say, well, um, yeah, when, when East West Players does Three Sisters, you'll be able to do that. And I thought, well, why do I have to wait? And why does it have to be all Asian? But at the same time, why can't the family be Asian, right? There, there are Asiatic looking people in Russia, right? <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, you know, this area, this very giant swath of land, you know, was part of the spice trade and spice road. And there would have been a multicultural, you know, um, diverse group of people who would have coexisted here. And there's, you know, history of that. 
So I don't understand why we are so limited in our view of who can do check of, right? And who can, you know, who can do these things. Um, so we had that um, going into it. I know that's, that's a lot, <laughs> but that was sort of how we started and how we wanted to move forward of both inviting fellow artists who we knew um, had had a lot of training and experiences who maybe didn't just want to, you know, get involved with people they didn't necessarily trust. Um, so we had that in mind, as well as wanting to serve the storytelling, because we had had a lot of dramaturgical training, right? How do we service the story? And how do we also demonstrate to the greater theater community how this can be done with intentionality and not just, oh, yeah, I guess we can kind of do that in with Shakespeare, but nothing else. We're, different people can play different things. Um, but then, you know, you really do end up seeing, you know, IPOC people or people with a global majority, folks doing sidekick roles, right? As opposed to being featured. Um, that's a whole lot to unpack. <laughs> and then uh, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we didn't really necessarily intend to be, um, you know, edgy and postmodern in our aesthetic um, except that we were in a film town and we saw how people made things, which was to find the location. And we thought, well, why not find the location and not be tied down to having a high overhead of, you know, trying to build a building or get a building or rent a building, rent a space, you know, and put all of our money in that and not pay people. So we really wanted to upend the uh, economics of, um, what is the budget for your show and try to focus on the um, people and not the stuff, you know? So that's how that started. <laughs> yeah, I was reading um, about Chalk on their website or, and when I saw that you choose location over building a set so that you can distribute more of your budget to actually paying your actors, like that warmed my heart so much. I wish more theaters did that, where they went more for the equity of paying the people that are working for them and like mm -hmm. showing craft and being so like vulnerable with them and uh, committed versus the spectacularity of the set and the design and everything. Because um, I, I watched your, um, that little video clip and uh, saw a few of the locations that, um, you all sh had performances in and the, the fact that you've become a leader in site-specific site theater in Los Angeles, where like you've partnered with sites as grand as like the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and UCLA's uh, William Andrews Clark Memorial Library. And um, I, I think uh, somewhere I read that you also used the location of, of a garage in someone's home. Um, and like, how, how have you gone 11 seasons doing that and like remaining successful and, and growing uh, as a community? Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that that's what that looks like on the inside. We're just like, you know, it's like one foot in front of the other. <laughs> and I have some thoughts and advice on, um, you know, I don't think that we necessarily and this is my advice for anyone who's starting a theater company. I think dare to dream, dare to dream big and dare to dream about how you want to see this grow. I don't think we did that. You know, we just started and we just thought like, what is it that we want to do right now? And um, through a lot of scrappy, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, ingenuity and um, making connections with people and people having space where we could make a, an arrangement that made you know, financial sense for the project where, you know, we'd either split box office or they would collect all of the box office and they paid us a fee to put the show there because there's a mutual interest or they had a grant or we had a grant. You know, the, there's so many different iterations of how to produce. Um, but we also, because we individually in our collective um, had our own specific careers that we were focused on, we didn't necessarily have this desire to really grow in the way that other institutions have grown and said like, oh no, this is the thing that we're gonna do. Um, I don't know if that's a, 
for better or for worse, right? Um, we didn't have that intention. And I can see how that could be, I mean, it's, I guess it's not too late, <laughs> but um, it could feel like a missed opportunity based on where we are right now. But we've not had to, for the kinds of projects that we wanna do, we've not had to make it our life's work to fundraise you know, in the way that other theater companies have had to do. But we can fundraise for the kind of work that we want to do, but we don't have to fundraise for the institution. Yeah. Um, and so that's a very specific way of existing, you know, that I don't, I, I can't say that I recommend it or not recommend it. It just has to be what you want it to be. But I can speak to the limitations of that, that, you know, in terms of we don't have a plan for growth right now because of that, right? And so maybe we should, um, if there seems to be more interest in that. <laughs> and we've taken, and you know, we've taken a little bit of a pause in the last couple of years, as everyone has, and we have um, actually um, an audio project um, that had been envisioned even before the pandemic, uh, where it was, uh, it's modeled a little bit after Pokemon Go where you would go to a location and then the location would um, trigger the audio experience. Um, but, you know, with the pandemic, we haven't been able, you know, we can't wrap our minds around, we can't really encourage people to go um, and do something if they don't feel safe to do it. And so we sort of pivoted, um, especially since we, um, had specifically written for a grant servicing certain districts, um, and it was you're supposed to ride the expo line, the metro line. You know, we can't encourage people to do that, so we've had to pivot. Um, and there's still some in, you know, putting our spin on the work. Um, the audio engineers, the audio designers are um, going to the location and capturing the sound in a three dimensional way to then you know, engineer back into, as opposed to it just being, you know, a play that we do fully on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and That's so there will cool. still be a map, yeah, for folks who really feel safe enough or maybe they're local or, you know, um, to explore the neighborhood or see where the neighborhood is. But hopefully we are now bringing the neighborhood to you. Yeah. No, that's, that sounds incredible. And I'm looking forward to uh, when that becomes available. Um, moving into uh, what you do, like the work you, that you do at UC San Diego, um, what advice do you give students who want to expand diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the theater realm, but don't know where to start? Um. Very good question. I don't know that I have direct, like, this is what you do, um, but I can speak to my philosophy, both as an artist and my philosophy in training, um, that I personally think that our current issue um, is and that we see cultural difference as artistic deficiency, you know, and I can see that in terms of literary staff, you know, in the types of plays that are chosen in artistic staff, the kinds of plays that are chosen, um, critics, the kinds of plays that are decided on are good, right? And the kinds of plays that are decided are overly ambitious, messy, you know, um, all that, that generally are, you know, kind of dog whistle vocabulary for, oh, that was written by a woman of color, you know, that you can see these patterns of criticism, not just in theater, but also, you know, in the world of literature, novels, um, essays, whatever, um, that there, there are these patterns of criticism. And, um, and so how that translates both to training and, and maybe where I want my students to focus is about what is it that they want to do? And can we decenter whiteness in our approach? So, for example, right in professional business development, as opposed to trying to figure out what is your type in the business, right? What is your essence, and what essence is it that you want to bring to storytelling? 
And then in training for the actor, it's not about, oh, you have this bad habit, right? Oh, and that student is great and makes great bold choices, right? There has to be an acknowledgement that, oh, that person who we've seen as, oh, the good, brave artist or brave actor who takes up space and makes choices right and left has had the privilege of feeling safe their entire life to be able to bring that to the work, right? And somebody who has like um, had to enter a space and figure out that, is this a safe space for me to be, right? And then when they feel um, that their creativity will be supported in the room can then emerge, right? That that person just, is, and usually a person of color, right? Um, or LGBTQ community, um, right? Any, anyone who's experienced any kind of trauma, um, that that person's habits, right? Are beautiful and wonderful and have allowed them to thrive and survive to this point. And so now training is an invitation to expand further, right? Um, give, give their instrument more tools. So, um, and I really came to this realization, I have to say, um, when I was auditioning folks for uh, Viet Gone at East West Players, and, you know, I'm a little bit of um, a provocateur and anarchist, and, and I felt like I could say this or ask, give this note and in the auditions, but I would see a lot of Asian men decide for themselves that they were coming in for the friend part or do a monologue that I did not think really showcased, you know, who they were as a leading man, especially if they're, you know, auditioning for the leading man. And so I would say, can you make choices as if you had white privilege? Or could you make, what kind of choices would you make if you're a white man? And I would literally, and part of, Part of me saying this was just to say to see what kind of note you know they would take or how the actor would process this but i would literally watch people become talented right and it wasn't talent right as much as it was that this artist felt safe to be as bold as they possibly could right and and i had a shortcut with my AAPI community to be able to say this, right? Not everyone can say this and it wouldn't be appropriate in all situations. Um, I was really shook <laughs> by that experience um, and seeing that. And, um, you know, so I really believe that any, anyone can grow their talent, right? Your talent is your sensitivity and sensitivity Activity is related to emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is malleable for your entire life, right? It is not a fixed point in the way that you have like IQ, which is fixed, right? But emotional intelligence is not fixed. They have, there's tons of research on this. Um, and so you have the choice to grow this aspect of you that is directly related to also what people use in acting and storytelling. So that's, I guess that's, that's an answer to how I combat <laughs> yeah, uh, you, systemic racism. It's, it's so empowering. Like I, it, for lack of a better term, like to um, know that like directors and actors such as yourself are out there breaking those boundaries, being radical and um, like empowering others in our community to be to be talented and to to break those walls down of who we think we are because of the colonized society that we grew up in mm -hmm. uh, like it's incredible and i am so inspired by your work um oh thank you <laughs> so um uh as as we wrap up do you have any uh last uh, words of wisdom for our oh god i don't know if i have any wisdom i feel like i'm you know <laughs> i'm just bumbling forward just like the next person and you know um i think it's so we're in a really exciting time where a lot of people are doing a lot of learning myself included and i think there is a daily struggle to be better that you know all of these isms that we are being held, you know, limited by 
um, they're not fixed points where we are suddenly, oh, we've solved it, right? <laughs> and I can see how that might be frustrating for, for folks who are experiencing a certain amount of fragility and having their worlds rocked, right? Like, oh, I thought I, I just got it and now the, the goalposts have changed. But I think just like, you know, your growth as a human being is not a fixed point. <laughs> you know, this idea of being better is not a fixed point and, and you know, focuses, focusing on diversity and inclusion. Um, and I guess I just hope that everyone can be a little bit more understanding about the mistakes, right? That I, I see, I do see the, the flip side of it is that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of heated discussion that can sometimes be intense enough to make people stop trying, you know? And I guess for both, both right, those trying that you keep trying and for everyone to, can we make space, you know, to make the mistake? and move forward. I know that sounds like all vague and whatever, but you know, I, I'm like speaking for myself, I'll speak of the I, that, you know, this idea of decolonizing this, that, and the other, you know, I just learned that decolonization is not a metaphor that really we're trying to talk about diversifying and that I'm using that word incorrectly when I, uh, but my intention, right, is to dismantle systems of oppression um, and so uh, I, I can just see how may, I could, right? I can see how I could be discouraged, like, oh, okay, well, I'm not even getting it right. So maybe I shouldn't, maybe this isn't my lane. Maybe I shouldn't try. But I think we all, we're going to need everybody, right? We all need to try and move forward if, if we're going to get any better. I completely agree. Thank you so much for joining us. It was amazing getting to converse with you. Oh, thanks, Shlipi. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, loved meeting all of you and um, have a wonderful day. <laughs> <laughs>